So Gary Small, uh, is all this technology changing our brains or is it pretty much a steady state since the fifth century before Christ and we've just been sort of playing different games on the outside? It's clearly changing our brains. I mean, our brains are very sensitive to what's going on from moment to moment. Whether you're looking at someone's facial expression, a person or a machine, no matter what it is, or if you're looking at a computer screen, or if you're reading a book, there's a cascade of neurochemical, neurophysiological, electrical events that are going on from moment to moment. So it's a, a very dynamic organ, and it's, it's not only very changeable and dynamic from moment to moment, but it's very specialized. And if I could get to my first PowerPoint slide, sure. you don't mind? Sure, yeah. Here you're looking at an experiment. There are four brains that uh, are measuring a, an event. And the event is a single word. And one of the images, the volunteer is saying the word. In another image, the volunteer is just thinking about the word or hearing about the word. And you can see that very different areas of the brain are being triggered. The word is the same, but the way it's processed differs. And so you have a very different neural pattern. Now, an important point is that if we spend a lot of time in a particular mental experience over and over again, in a sense, the neural circuits controlling that experience will strengthen. And if we neglect other experiences, they'll weaken. It's like practice makes perfect. Yeah. And <laughs> it does, but it's, a, it's more complex than that because in some ways uh, it can be very good. I mean, our brains are a bit like our bodies. If you practice something quite a bit, our brains become more efficient. So in this experiment, for example, if you heard the same word over and over again, you wouldn't see as much neural activity because your brain would be able to process it better and use less energy, just like when you go and you work out. You can do more and use less energy. Now, this kind of gets back to the, the emotional part of the brain. And, you know, we can take something like texting or shorthand like this. Uh, how many of us text? Okay, how many of us are texting right now? <laughs> <laughs> the one answer, they're texting. That's right. It's, you know, it's, I learned how to text through my teenage daughter. And, I, you know, it's... It, I can see how it brings out a, a feeling in me. You, know, you can actually talk to her as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, you obviously don't know her. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, so here's Great. LOL is what? Okay, okay, very good. Lots of love, that was somebody had a different. Now this I thought was Good Morning America, but it's not, what is that? <laughs> Great minds think alike. Let's try the next one. Now this is something my daughter would text to me. If we can get the answer, get a life. Get a life, nice. Okay. And then this one, I won't tell her I know what it means. PRW means parents are watching. <laughs> and, then, and then we can take to the next image, emoticons. We all know about the smiley face or the happy face. Uh, but then we can get creative. If we go to the next one, this is the startled face. You have to tilt your head. This is Elvis Presley. <laughs> and does anybody know who this is? John Lennon, very good. So you can get creative with it, and you can see how we're just kind of looking at these symbols, and yet we're laughing and we're thinking about it. And you know, a lot of the, the parents are concerned that their kids are texting or they're using all this shorthand. I'm not so concerned about it because we know young brains are very malleable and flexible. They're great at learning languages. So but just one thing on that great slide is that what it shows is that even though the emoticon is a tiny little symbol, there's an enormous amount of information stored in the brain that's triggered by very simple little symbols. Yeah, and so it may be a small symbol, but can, it can be a huge reaction in the brain. And we've certainly seen that in our experiments at UCLA. We can see an experiment that was done looking at something I've been concerned about that I expressed about my teenage daughter, and that is with all the technology input, that it may be affecting our ability to communicate face-to-face, -face. that you don't have the eye contact, we're not learning to recognize nonverbal cues. And in this particular study, the scientists asked the volunteers who were in their late teens, early 20s, asked them to look at a face 
morph from, say, a neutral face to an angry face or to a happy face. And it was a little bit like a game show where they hit a buzzer and they timed it and they found that when these volunteers played a violent video game before the experiment, they lost the happy face advantage. So there's a suggestion, at least with some kind of technology interaction, it may be interfering with that skill that we have as humans. I'm not completely clear on that. So if you played the violent video game, you had difficulty identifying that there was a happy face present, or? You were slower to recognize the emotional content of the face, but just the happy face. You know, I think one implication is that when we're spending a lot of time with that kind of activity, it is distracting, distracting our emotional recognition neural circuits from doing their job. Now, it doesn't mean that the brain can't write itself. I think because the brain is quite plastic, we can change the brain quite quickly. So if we look at, at the next image, this is a study we did that we called Your Brain on Google. And we found people, we wanted to see what the brain looks like the first time it searches online. So we took a group of these people who were internet naive, and we compared them to internet savvy people. And so you're looking at a series of images here. And this is uh, what we did. We put people in a functional MRI scanner. And so we can measure what the brain is doing from moment to moment with any kind of experiment. So we simulated what it was like to read a book page. And then we simulated an internet search. And the volunteers had little keypads uh, that allowed them to operate a mouse. And they searched online. And we found that the brain pattern, the colored areas on those brains, were almost identical, regardless of whether somebody was internet savvy or internet naive, or whether they were searching online or whether they were reading a book. But the big difference, you can see that one brain that's red, where it was much larger activation, was when the internet savvy people searched online. So if we can just go to the next image. Uh, this is your brain on a book and moving along. This is your brain on Google. And so there was a two-fold increase in activity. Now, of course, the headlines were Google's making us smart, which isn't really exactly what we showed. But it did show that Google was activating the brain. And in fact, when we took those internet naive people, and these were people who were in their mid-60s, and we said, OK, we want you to practice searching online for a week, just an hour a day. After just one week, there was highly significant increase in areas of the brain, in the thinking brain, the frontal lobe, areas that control decision making and very short term memory. And you, know, you always hear about you, you can't teach an old brain new tricks. Well, I think you can. So I think that even an older brain is quite plastic. 